We are moving on to our second part of our God of the Impossible series. And if you weren't here last week, we spoke about how God is calling us as a nation to rekindle hope in our hearts. That, you know, when we're facing all the difficulties, you know, seriously, I, I said this last week and it's been even true this week, is that every time I open my news app on my phone, I'm just like, I have to take a deep breath beforehand because whatever I'm going to see there, you know, it's, it's like shocking every time. Even if I open it up like three times a day, I get a shock each time. And I feel like God is shaking this nation and sometimes that can produce um, a sense of hopelessness in our hearts. But I... I guess what God is wanting to say to each and every one of us is that this is not a hopeless time. This is a time when he is shaking the nation to bring about a revolution in the hearts of the people and a revolution in the way this nation operates. And that he is asking us to rekindle hope in our hearts. He's asking us to align our thinking with heaven's thinking. That we can't afford to be hopeless. Because the more we, uh, our thinking will give to us what that thinking projects. And God is asking us to think like heaven so that heaven becomes our portion here on earth. I'm not talking about dying and going to heaven. I'm saying heaven heaven coming to us. You got that. And then we're talking about ending dualism, which means um, ending the, that double-mindedness. That we're going, to, we're going to choose to think God's thoughts. We're going to choose to bring all of our lives under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And we're going to choose to let him be the master of all. Amen. And last of all, we're going to expect a power encounter. We're going to expect God to invade. Church, this nation is poised for revival. This nation is poised for an invasion of heaven, invasion of his presence. Your workplace is just waiting for a demonstration of God's love. They've heard people speak about Jesus, but now they want to meet him. And you are the one that is that God is going to use to introduce himself to them. Amen. Today we're moving on to our our second series, second part of the series, and I just want to pray as we go. Lord, thank you for this great, great people. Thank you, Lord God, that that you are using us to set this nation alight. I thank you for each person that here that represents an entire community and i want to pray for each of those members of that community lord god that the fire that is in the heart of each person here would spread into those places lord god father god we just proclaim lord god i just i just love that um logo on the men's thing no man left behind but we just pray no member of these people's community left behind every single person brought into the kingdom every person coming to know you lord god just Just a revolution in our environments, a godliness, a grassroots godliness coming to us. And Lord, I pray that as I preach today, Lord God, that you would remind me of what you need need said today and that you would touch our hearts with truth. And all of God's people said, amen and amen and amen. When, um, well, Andrew and I have planted a number of churches and um, the one particular nation that we went to we arrived there with, we were on support, and we arrived there with less money than the amount, the, the cost of our rent each month. So we knew it was going to be a miraculous journey. If we were going to survive, if we were going to make it through one month, God was hand- going to have to come through. God uh, came through in incredible ways, absolutely incredible ways. One of the ways that just blew my mind is that really we lived, we lived by faith day by day by day by day renting a house and after we'd been there some years just God laid on our hearts that he wanted to give us the house that we were living in miraculously with no deposit we got a loan to purchase the house and we took out a bond and over the months that we were there this is the wild thing um, we sometimes were able to pay our full bond payment sometimes we were only able to pay the interest because it was uh, finances were very, very tight, and you know, I often wondered, God, is this is this the bless uh, the best that you can do in your blessing of us? You know, I, you know, I expect the kingdom to be a place of abundance, and every time I would say that to him, I just I would see a smile come onto his face and just like a like just wait kind of an attitude, and <laughs> being a you know just wanting to continue trusting God, we carried on. Lo and behold, when we left that nation, we sold that house, and here's the wild thing. God caused the the housing market to skyrocket just before we had to sell. We we had paid off very little of the bond, but we sold the house for double what we bought it. 
Now, I just want, I want you to understand. So in other words, God gave us a house in money terms. We came to South Africa and bought a house with that money. So I just, I feel like I just wanted to start that, um, start the sermon with the story just to say that there is a God out there who is so good at breaking through impossible barriers that anything that stands before you and and what you believe God has called you to, God, God is breaking through that. He's making a way for you. There is, there is a God who is on your side. And against impossible odds, you are going to find yourself standing blessed and able to bless many others. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand? I just don't, I feel like, I feel like he's, he's so much better. He's so much better than we think. Yeah. I want to read for you or read with you a story in John 2. It's the first miracle, public miracle that Jesus ever did. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. But it starts off like this, on the third day, verse 1, John 2, verse 1, on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. I know this is freaky, because Jesus made wine for people who, wedding ceremonies in those days went on for a week. Do you understand that? They had been drinking for days on end. You know what, I, I, you know, most of us would think the wine is gone, good riddance. But, but to some degree, and this is not to promote drunkenness at all, seriously. <laughs> but I, what I do feel like is so profound is that God loves celebration. Yeah, he does. Your God just loves loves it when we have a good time really he does yeah. he loves it when there is when there are his people together and they celebrating life celebrating yeah. weddings celebrating yeah. births yeah. celebrating victories he loves it so much that throughout the old testament he mandated certain times during the year where they had to have a feast That's right. it was like uh, i am i am demanding that you have a good time That's right. That's how God is. He just, he loves celebration, absolutely loves celebration. Jesus says this, and in the original, it's a little bit irritated. The tone that Jesus uses here is, indicates that he's a little bit irritated with his mom, which never happens in any of your families. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. You know, I, I just, it makes me think about what it must have been like raising Jesus. <laughs> you know, really, what, I mean, what must that have been like? How did she know he could do something about the situation? Yeah. How did she know? I'm telling you, as a mom, I mean, I think it would have been glorious. I mean, I, m moms, maybe you love cooking. It's just, I, I have a list of things I love to do. Cooking is right, right, right at the bottom. <laughs> right at the bottom. I still do it. I still do it. But, you know, I just, I just feel like Mary would, would walk into the kitchen, and if she was like me, it's like, oh, my gosh, it's that time of the day again. What have I got in my larder? And then if I was her, I would have just turned to Jesus and said, here's a fish. What can you do with it? <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so the only reason that I can think she knew is that Jesus and her were having some fun in the kitchen up to this point. That there was some stuff happening there. There was some stuff happening there. I mean, maybe she never had to go grocery shopping because he just multiplied everything. Oh, gosh, let's all stick with Jesus. It moves on and it says, Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing and holding, and each, sorry, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. These are huge, guys. This is like 80 to 120 liters. It's a lot of water. It was either a big wedding or God was being very generous. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars, the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water they had been 
that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from. This is a good thing. You think that's just a, a minor detail, but he did not realize where it had come from. In essence, when they filled up the jars, they were filling up the bars. You understand, this was ceremonial washing. Jesus made wine, not just out of water, out of bath water. <laughs> out of bath water. And so the fact that he didn't know where it, it came from was probably a good thing. You know what I'm saying? I have this story. I, my grandmother used to always, always tell this story, and it went like this, that her and some friends were sitting around when um, she was young, and one of their little girls came in with one of those porcelain uh, pretend tea sets. You know them. And um, she had water in the teapot, and she was pouring into the little cups, and she was giving it to each of the moms, and they were drinking it and like being very kind. Oh, this is delicious tea. <laughs> And then suddenly my grandmother thought, I wonder where she's getting this water. She's not, <laughs> she's not big enough to get to the tap. So they followed her, and lo and behold, she was scooping it out of the toilet. <laughs> I, think, I think this man would have felt a little bit like that if he'd known where the water had come from. But none is, sometimes it's best we don't know. You know, some things are best kept secret. <laughs> and the, the, just the last sentence there, he, d he did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Moving on, then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. You know what he's saying? It's like they wait till they get drunk and then they bring out the, the, the bad stuff. But you have saved the best till now. Isn't that like God? You know, just when you think... It it's can't get better. He just ups the game. You know, just when I thought I got married to Andrew and I thought I was living in heaven, I thought this is the best thing ever. And then I had David. And then I was like, oh, my word, God just upped the game. And then I had Karen. And oh, my word, this is even better. Than that. Then I had Joshua. And it's like, oh, my word. And I had to stop there. But I... <laughs> but... <laughs> you know, that's just how God is. You think you've reached a plateau. You think, you think that, you know, what he's done for you is so great. He hasn't even begun yet, church. You know, you know what? We look at the revivals through the ages, and you think those are so fantastic. And I feel like sometimes when we say, God, can we have a revival like that? He's going, is that all? Yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, sometimes when you, we, we ask him for things, I feel like, He's saying, gosh, is that all? It's something like that measure that you use that, that um, Andrew was talking about. Sometimes our prayers are using a very little measure. Because the God we serve so wants to outdo your expectation. Thank you, darling. See what a great husband I have. So great. So great. Where were we? Last paragraph. This, the first of the miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana of Galilee, he then revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. I feel like one of the purposes of this whole creation, of this whole creation, is that God wants to blow our minds with his glory. I feel like I feel like he just wants to show off how absolutely mind-blowingly good he is. And I feel like I, I just want to prophesy to every person here that there is there's something outstanding, outstanding God wants to do in your life. His plans for you are not small, they're not insignificant. They're not ordinary. He wants to pull away the veil from your eyes and from the eyes of the people around you. And he wants to do stuff that just makes people say, oh, my word, this God you serve is so good. Yeah. I was at a reunion of, I got saved in a church called Maranatha. It was a tiny little church. Andrew and I got saved. He was actually on staff there. Um, it was the precursor of what has become his people in Johannesburg. And we had a reunion of all those original people that were there at that church last night. And we walked in, and the first thing Andrew said is, oh, my word, you're all so old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was from 26 years ago, that's right. And 
But you know, while I was just hanging out with them and we were just talking, reminiscing about the good old days, and then we started asking questions about what God had done in their lives. And you know, all of them are these just vibrant, alive, healthy families, uh, just doing stuff in life. You know, they've, they've moved on and they've just become great people. And, I, and, I, and this is the other thing, just radical. You know, I remember those early days, how, how radical we were in Jesus. And, I mean, we were just like girls. We were like, I'm loving Jesus above everyone. I'm never kissing another boy till I get married. I'm, I'm serving him with my whole heart. I'm preaching to my lecturers. I'm preaching to my classmates. I mean, we were, I know you're thinking, why is it radical? That was pretty radical. I mean, we were, <laughs> we... We were, we were radical. Ra- I mean, we went to church Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and then on Sunday just for good measure. We didn't really go that often. <laughs> we didn't really go that often, but we lived in each other's homes. You know, we lived in community, so it felt like we were having church 24-7. Yeah. And I just look at the fruit of what it produced in those lives of the people and the fruit that it produced in, in what this church has become in Johannesburg. And, I, you know, I... It blew my mind to think that that little seed, we didn't think we were significant. We just thought we were, we were just enjoying Jesus and loving one another. And lo and behold, God took that moment and created a movement. He's created a movement. He's created churches all over the city. He's, crea- he's, he's united us to churches over the, the entire world. And our presence is being felt. And I feel like this is the kind of thing God wants to do in all of our lives. The seed of who you are, he wants to germinate into a movement of sorts. (laughs) Thank you. You know what I love about this story is I, I often wondered why Jesus started with this. Well, how could his mother persuade him to actually start when he, it appears that he wasn't really interested in starting miracles. I feel like he looked at the situation. I don't know for sure. This is just me surmising. But when I read it, the story is such a great parable of life and our journey in the kingdom that I feel like to some degrees, he was doing this miracle, but he was also creating an analogy for us. Yeah. What I love about this is that he started with empty stone jars. Yeah. And I feel like that's how he starts with us. You know, when we come to him, really, there's, there's the form, the outer form of God's image in our physical beings, but there's not much else. And I've noticed something about Jesus is that he loves the potential of what you can become more than he loves how good you are at stuff. Because he is so going to exceed your human goodness that really that's not immaterial to him. So your achievements, how great you've been at stuff, when you come to him, those are not really what he's interested. He's interested in how much of him you can hold. That's really what he's interested in. Huh. One of my s- slides has been deleted there. Oh, no. But don't worry, I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pity I don't have the pictures. I'll have to describe them to you. It's, uh, I actually had two pictures of one was a, um, an indigenous African couple from... Yeah, it, was right there. There. Yeah. it was there, it was there. Yeah. No, no. Oh, there we go. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I just was clicking too hard. I'm just getting too enthusiastic on this clicker. It makes you feel like you're powerful when you click this thing. <laughs> so at the top we have Simeon Nsabambi and his wife and underneath Cho Church and his wife. And when this incident happened, they were a lot younger than that. But the story goes that Joe Church, he was living in Rwanda. He was a missionary there. And he, 
he had seen very little success and he was very, very discouraged. And he, he felt like he wanted to go um, and have kind of a break in Kampala, Uganda. And so he traveled to Kampala, Uganda. This is in September of 1929. And uh, he went to the cathedral there just to seek God's presence. And as he was coming out of the church, there he met Simeon. And he struck up a conversation and Simeon was a church leader who was having some level of success in Uganda, but also not the success that he had desired. And he, he, he turned to Joe and he said, you know, I, I wonder what it would take to get all of God in Uganda. And Joe and Simeon struck up this friendship and how it began is that they, they went to Simeon's house and they pretty much locked themselves in a room for two days. I assume they weren't married then. That's what I assume. I don't know how well they would have gone down if they'd been married. But nonetheless, they locked themselves in a room for two days, and all they did was pray and read the Bible and sought God together. The result afterwards was something spectacular. It, it has been recorded as one of the greatest revivals yeah. in church history, the East African Revival of the 1920s and 1930s. Most of the pastors in the Protestant arena in Tanzania, Kenya, that region today, point back to this revival as the start of either the movement or their parents' influence on them. Yeah. Still to this day, this revival is ringing through that region. Yeah. Joe went to be back to Rwanda and started preaching repentance for the forgiveness of sins and thousands and thousands of people came. Simeon started in Uganda and thousands and thousands of people came. The survival just swept through the entire East African nations and created a, like a vortex of people felt, people felt out if they weren't Christian. <laughs> it created an environment where everyone was just running to get saved. The reason I love this story is that these were two empty vessels. You know, they, they, weren't, they weren't like profoundly successful. They weren't like lauded in the press as great heroes. These were just two men who just were trying to do God's will. And at a time when they were at their most empty, they did what is right. They allowed God to fill them. The other thing I love is that Probably the greatest revival we've ever had in Africa was started by a black and white man together. Right. I feel like it's almost like God's saying or making a stamp of how he loves unity. How he is determined to create a kingdom where everyone's welcome. How determined he is to create an inclusive place where everyone is valued and loved and celebrated. Some symptoms of emptiness, inflexibility, insensitivity, cravings, loneliness, not growing, alienation and feeling overwhelmed. Maybe that's what Joe Church felt. But I feel like all of us at some stage go through some of these emotions. Have you felt any one of those? Don't raise your hand. Or should we just all raise our hand to make everyone feel comfortable? We've all felt that. But I feel like Jesus specializes in those moments. Specializes in those moments. The Bible describes that emptiness in Ephesians 4 like this. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Amen. Let's all go. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I mean, there's some verses in the Bible you don't ever want to end on, and that is one of them. But basically, Jesus is describing, or Paul, Jesus through Paul, is describing a state of being separated from God and that sense of empty stone in your heart. 
Luckily, Jesus didn't leave it like that. And he, he fills us. Like I said, he's more interested in your potential to hold him than he is in anything else. The Bible talks about in Acts 2 that in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. You know, I I sometimes feel like in our lives, God is watching every moment and he is just waiting for us to turn to him so he can pour out more. Bam. It's like the eagerness to be with us, be in us, and be on us is a characteristic of God that you see throughout the Bible. This prophecy was prophesied thousands of years before Christ came. It's almost like God couldn't keep quiet. It's like, I want to tell you what I want to do. I can't wait for that moment when I have opportunity to be in my people, be on my people. To fill them, to take away that emptiness. I see the pain, the the hardship, the difficulty that they're going through. I can't wait till I can remedy that. What I love about it is how multi-generational it is. He talks about the sons and daughters. He talks about the old men and the young men. The older I get, the more I understand that the old men dream dreams. is because we spend a lot more time sleeping. He pours out on men and women. I love that. (laughs) I love that. It's like the kingdom of God is violently inclusive. Seriously, God is unwilling to leave anyone out. Unwilling. And he pours out on servants. (laughs) That's That's not on people that are coming to him saying, Look how great I am. You really need me in the kingdom. It's like people that are coming and saying, God, whatever you need, whatever you want to do, here I am. I confess I'm empty. I just need you. Come fill me and whatever you need to do, I'm here. So how do we get filled? Because it's kind of a nebulous term. The Bible talks about these these strange things. First of all, no, sorry. It talk, the Bible does talk about strange things, a lot of strange things. But some of these are strange and some of them aren't strange. <laughs> the, first thing, the first way that God talks about, or the Bible talks about us being filled with the Spirit is that hands are laid on us. Like we simply go and ask, I want to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want more of the Spirit. Please Will you pray for me? Obviously, you have to ask someone who's already baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can't just go into any man in the street. But as they lay their hands on you, there is a transfer of the kingdom truth and the kingdom presence of the Holy Spirit from them to you. This is one of the weird ones. That we can be filled by drinking. Not wine, but the Spirit. But what is... You know, sometimes people say, just drink of the Spirit. I just, it means nothing to me. I don't know. How do I drink of the Spirit? Do I just go, <laughs> and how long do I have to go, <laughs> for before I get it? You know, it's like, what, what, what did Jesus mean when he said, those who are thirsty, come to me and drink. Those who believe out of their innermost being will throw rivers of living water. That's what he said in John 7. What, what did he mean by drink of me? I mean, Jesus isn't here. I'm going to must have suck on his shoulder or something. You know, it's like, it's, it, it just doesn't make sense. Just when you read it like that. But what he was talking about, he was talking about opening up your heart to his presence. He was talking about coming to a place of admitting that you dry and need him. Coming to a place of saying that I believe that you have what I need and opening up your heart to that. And as you believe that he is filling you, he is filling you. I know it's a, it sounds like, gosh, is, can it be that simple? Yes, it really can be that simple. The next thing is waiting or soaking. Have you heard people talk about soaking prayer? You know, also when I first heard that term, I was like, what? Soaking prayer, it sounds like lying in a bath for a long time. And it's quite similar. But the Bible talks about those who wait on the Lord will rise up on wings as eagles. They will run and not go weary. They will walk and not faint. 
And it's not just sitting around tapping your foot like, when's God going to come through? When's God going to come through? That's not what waiting means. Waiting means literally quieting your soul in the expectation of his answer. It means quietening yourself and um, pushing away other influences so that you can become aware of his presence. I want to encourage you every day to do this. The first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I come into God's presence and I just wait. I don't have words. I don't tell him the 10 things I need from him. I simply become aware of his presence and I say, God, I love you. Come and love me. And him and I, we just, we're just with each other. Sometimes he talks, sometimes he doesn't. And I can just feel, feel the, the life filling up my soul. And I want to encourage you every day to do that. Meditating on his word. Psalm 1 verse 2 and 3 says that those who meditate on his word are like trees beside rivers of water. They bear their fruit in season. Their leaves never wither. That means thinking about the the Bible, which means you have to read it. (laughs) You can't know. You can't meditate on something you've never read. But it means taking scriptures and like maybe writing them out of a piece of paper and sticking them in your pocket. And every time you put your hand in your pocket, you're reminded of that scripture and then you just think about it. Like in that moment, just think about it. Maybe having some reminders on your phone like once or twice a day that come up and with a scripture on and you just take a moment where you are. Ah, I just remember that you're with me and you never leave me. Meditate on allowing that to rework your mind. And allowing the truth that it contains to fill your soul. You know that fellowship, being around other Christians. Being around other Christians. We don't just come to church because it's duty. It's because we get filled by it. We don't just go to connect group because it's the right thing to do and to please our pastors. We go to connect group because there's a a filling of our empty stone with his presence through the fellowship of one another that sometimes the filling that you need is not going to come from an angel dropping something out of the sky. It's going to come from your neighbor praying for you. Ministry, prayer, prophecy. Just going to someone and saying, I'm empty and I'm dry. Will you pray for me? Will you prophesy over me? Will you tell me the truth? Would you allow me, give me a moment and stand with me as Jesus fills me? The last thing Jesus did, or the analogy that this parable tells us is that, what would be the good of turning all that water into wine if no one ever got to taste it? I don't know when the water actually turned to wine. I mean, did it turn as the as the servants poured it into the jars or then I'm sure they didn't move those jars because they were huge did they take a jug and dip it in and was it wine when they brought it out or was it only wine when they poured it into the glasses of the people at the tables but at some stage that water became wine but it's only it was only relevant to the people when they could taste it your the changes and the glory that God is bringing about in your life is only relevant when other people can taste it. It's only relevant when you are poured out in your environment, when you step out of the boat, step out of your comfort zone and become a drink offering for the people around you. You know, the greatest miracles I have seen have not been personal hidden miracles in my home. They've been miracles out there when I stood with someone who was in desperate need and and the life that God had placed in me touched their their empty stone and the wine that God had, the water that God of, of my humanity that had been turned into wine in my heart touched them and they tasted of Jesus and something changed. They were healed, they were delivered, they were set free. Paul said, And if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, talking to the Philippians, I am glad and rejoice with you all. If we only attempt what we can do, we will never experience what God can do. So I feel like my, my husband likes that. Church, I want us to be a church that attempts what we can't do. 
attempts the impossible. I want us to be a church that runs at the problems of this day and says we're serving a God who can make a difference here. Amen. Yes. Father, let's pray, church. Father, I want to ask that you would come and pour out your spirit here, Lord God. We just ask for more of you. Lord, we bring our, the empty vessels of our hearts to you, Lord God, and we ask that you would fill them with your presence. Come and fill us again, Lord God. We just ask where we are, Lord God, that you would come and fill us.